mountains of influence. Understanding the mountains of influence. So the angle we are coming from is to give you an understanding of what is called the mountains of influence. Buenas for sana. But as before we get into the mountains, we need to uh, give you a, a scripture foundation of what we are saying. Hallelujah. Are you getting me, friends? I learned a new word this year when we had our, it was it last year from Anthony Ashai. It was called the ambidextrous church. The ambidextrous church. It's a new word that to me, it was a new word to me. Uh, I've gone to school many years, but when I heard it, I said, hey, hold it, what does that? Because I was interested, even in the pronunciation. And uh, that understanding comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Read for me, what does it say? Now these were the men who came to David at Ziklag while he was still a fugitive from, the son, from Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men help us in the war. Hold it there. Don't, don't go beyond. Look at me. When we started teaching on transformers, remember I told you David was one of the transformers. Okay. Do you remember when I was talking about uh, being emotionally intelligent? We talked about David. How he picked a bunch of men who are what? Rejects? Fugitives? Hello? People who are in debt? Escapees? And he went with them to the cave of Adulam. And he started training them. And at the end of the day, they were called David's mighty men. And we are telling you that to be a transformer means you can be able to build teams around you to bring transformation. Because one is too small a number to bring transformation. So you need to have the ability of gathering people around you. Not necessarily winners. I mean, if you are going to gather around you men like uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, uh, Zuckerberg, uh, look, you can do that. But you're beginning with men who have already made it. But Jesus speaks fishermen. Fish, what? Fishermen, tax collectors, zealots. Are, are you getting the picture now? And at the end of three years, he gives them an assignment. He had worked on them. He gives them a what? An assignment. And look, that assignment, we are still running with it up to now. Because he transformed them. He says himself in the book of Mark, you follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's transformation. Talk to me, church. Now, a church that's not transforming itself, its members, and the members are not transforming the world, we are missing our purpose. That's why I taught you the other day, God says, I've given you as a light to the nation. You are a gift into society. Are you understanding, friends? So, these, these men who followed David, they joined David at Ziklag while he was hiding from Saul, son of Kish. They were among the mighty warriors who fought beside David in battle. All, all of, look at verse 2. What does he tell us? Verse 2 says what? All of them. Look at verse 2. Armed with what? Bows, using both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows with the bow. They were of Benjamin Saul's brethren. Are you seeing that they could use both their right hand and the left hand? That is what we call ambidextrous. Oh, I'm glad. Even me, I say the same thing. Oh. Are you understanding, you friends? In other words, these men and women, if ukimtokea mkono wa left, bado atakwangusha. So it does, you do not come and say, hey, he's weaker. The right hand is weaker than the left hand. Or the left hand is stronger, weaker than the right hand. No, they were ambidextrous. They could use either hand. And they could use stones. They could use arrows. They could, some of them could use stuff. If you read about the acts of David's mighty men, there's a catalog of them. Some of them just with a stick. They killed 300 people. And then enemies come. Are you understanding me, friends? So an ambidextrous church, we've got to understand, is a church that is relevant both in the world and in the, mar sorry, in the marketplace and in the church. In other words, you are relevant here 
and you are relevant out there. Let me teach you until this area gets it. Because if you get it, the others will also get it. I'm saying you are relevant in the house of God as well as you are relevant outside the house of God. Because sometimes you may find men who are only very relevant in the world, but they come to the house of God, they are totally irrelevant. And then you can find others who are only good in the house of God, put them outside the house of God in the marketplace, they become what? Irrelevant. Now, where we are going, push your neighbor, preach for me, tell your neighbor, where we are going, we cannot afford to be just, to be single-handed. We must be ambidextrous. We must be. An ambidextrous church. Are you understand me, friends? That means that is a church that is good in the marketplace and in the house of God. I'm trying to lay a foundation of understanding the mountains of influence. The biblical uh, rationale why we should understand this. It's because of the kind of calling that is upon us. Are we together, friends? We must be able to hurl stones and arrows using the left hand as well as the right hand. Do you have the New Life, New Life Translation Bible, Johnny? Give me that in the NLT, NLT, if you have that translation. Give me that uh, 1 Chronicles 12, verse 1 and 2 in the NLT. There it is in NLT. Uh-huh. Read for me. All of them were expert archers and they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their left hand as well as their right hand. Are you seeing the picture now? These are the, that, that, that one comes out better now. Are you following the picture now? In other words, if you are found in the civil service, you are very good. If you are found in the church, you are very good. So that you are not just good choir member, but a very bad civil servant. You are not just a very good civil servant, but a very poor usher. Wherever you are, in the house of God, in the marketplace, wherever you are, you are relevant. That's what we are talking about here. Are you understanding me, friends? Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Revelation 1, 6. What does this say? Pick it from verse 5. Pick it from verse 5. Pick it from verse 5. And from, read, you are reading with me? And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Does that mean salvation? Oh, please help me here. That, does that describe our salvation? So he's talking about people who are born again. Am I correct? Because he has loved us and washed us from our sins in his, in his own blood. Anybody who has had that experience, lift up your hand and tell me, Bishop, I know that experience. I've gone through it. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now look what he does with those people. What has he done to us? Read for me. And he has made us as what? Kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So, by washing us and making us children of God, what has he made us? Now, you are, you are missing a point. He has made us what? Kings, kings and what else? Yeah, exactly. Because a king is in the marketplace. A priest is in the house of God. So what we are teaching you here is not far-fetched. Oh, Bishop, you are teaching things that are far-fetched. No, it, this is scripture. He has made us to be kings. That's outside. The, the, are you understanding me now? To be priests, that's in the house of God. Kings outside the house of God. You don't bring your kingship here. But you're still a king. Talk to me. Because in the Old Testament, you know those two offices were completely separate. If you are king, you are not a priest. Because kings came from Judah. The priests came from Levi, uh, the tribe of Levi. Talk to me. 
But in Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, I say in Jesus, who was not a Levite, he still became the high priest of our faith. Jesus brings the two offices together in him. Are you understanding me now? That's why it says, now unto him. Pick it from verse 5 again. Pick it from verse 5 again. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, who was what? The firstborn from the dead. In other words, he begins a new line. Because in the old line, you could not be a priest and a king together. If you are a priest, you are not a king. If you are a king, you are not a priest. Talk to me, friends. Are you following what I'm trying to say? When Saul was a king, Samuel was the priest. When Samuel was late one time for a function, Saul took up the work of a priest and he lost his kingdom. He was told, that is not your work. That's meant for Samuel. You should have, Samuel told him, you should have waited for me. But because you never waited, the kingdom is taken from you. Are you following what I'm trying to say now? When David was a king, he was very hungry with his boys. They came to the temple. The only bread that was there was meant for the priests. It took a priest to wave and say, listen, take this and eat so that you may survive. But that bread was only meant to be eaten by priests. So you never mix those two offices. Am I making sense to somebody here? So even David himself made a mistake and it cost someone his life. When they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back from where it had been lost, he put it on a cart being led by soldiers because David was a soldier, military man. And when it looked like it was going to fall, a man called Uza put up his hand and touched it. And he died. And David realized this is serious because God had said this Ark of the Covenant must be carried on the shoulders of priests. So you can despise the priest, but they have got an assignment. You don't touch their work. Hello? But when Jesus Christ came and died, he begins a new lineage. That's why it's called the firstborn. It's called the what? It's called the what? In other words, the ones behind him, that chapter is closed. There's a new chapter. So you are in this generation. I said you are in this generation. You are not in the old generation. You are in the generation of the firstborn. Somebody say amen. amen. So what is, what is, this is the first one from the dead. What is he? And the, you are ready for me? I'm trying to expose this verse to so you can catch what we are trying to say. Who, who is Jesus Christ? He is the ruler over the kings. of. In other words, every ruler on the earth, he may think he's ruling, but Jesus is the ruler. Amen. I've taught you from Nebuchadnezzar's story. They thought they were ruling, they were discovered. Walijua Hawajui. They realize there's a God who rules over the affairs of men. Am I making sense? Nebuchadnezzar to bow before him. Belshazzar bowed before him. Darius bowed before him. Hello? Because Jesus Christ is still the ruler over the kings of the earth. So when we are talking about the ambidextrous church, you've got to understand the one that we are following is still the ruler in all the affairs of men. Somebody say amen. amen. He's the ruler of, of the kings of the earth. To whom? To him. Read for me. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Why was he doing all that? He was preparing for your future ministry. Amen. That's why he loved you. Don't go ahead of me. Put a scripture up there. That's why he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Why did you go, why did you go into all that trouble? He was preparing us for our future role. What's our future role? There's verse 6 now, go to verse 6. Because he has made us to be what? Kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Somebody say amen. amen. So in other words, he expects us when we come before his God, we are priests. When we go to the world, we reign as kings. Hallelujah. I know this looks far-fetched because... With you are used to someone laying hands on you and you falling down and waking up and doing some bicycle kicks on the ground and you think that's revival, which is okay. Maybe it's a form of revival, but I'm trying to push you beyond falling down. Let me teach you. You know, I talked looking at them, looking at them like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm trying to push you beyond being a Christian who just falls down in every revival meeting. 
that you understand God has a bigger purpose for you than falling down and demons being cast out of you. Hata kama ni pepo, si lazima ifike wakati pepo zimeisha. Kwa hiyo utakuwa na pepo kipepo kila Jumapili. You don't have to manifest demons every Sunday. That every Sunday when I stand up I must cast demons out of you. Mambi gonga jirani kwambia zilikwisha. Na kama iko inatoka leo nimeikata ipatie notice nikanyanga ndio kiruta nikanyanga bwana asifiwe sana he has made us what priests and what else tell me for me neighbor we are priests in the house kings out there is that am be us now look at chapter 5 of revelation revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. Pick it from verse 9. Let's see if you can get a, or the context. Or oh, this is when Christ is being, a, 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 uh, is being a, what, what do you call it? Uh, is, okay. Extol, is it install, extol, whatever. Okay. <laughs> These are angels singing. Read for me. What does it say? And they sang a new song. What are they? They are telling Jesus, eh? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you are slain and are redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and you tell me if that is not BBI. <laughs> I'm asking you a question. Tell me if that's not BBI. Where are people from every every nation, every color, hallelujah, have been brought together, washed by the blood of Jesus, hallelujah. Are we together, friends? And what else? Read again. And have made us what? Kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign. Where? That's what I was looking for. Where? I'm going to reign in heaven. The Bible says we start reigning where? That's what we are calling an ambidextrous church. Because many of us, when we are in the house of God, we are very good priests. Last Sunday, I was preaching about Daniel. When Daniel knew he's facing the lion's den, he looked for his altar. He looked for what? He opened his window towards Jerusalem. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor. Do you know where your altar is? Because when you are facing the, a, a den full of hungry lions, my sister, my brother, your survival depends on the altar that you are servicing. If you are not servicing any altar, hey, my brother, where you tell you an asimba? But if you know your altar, because altars fight, altars speak. That's why you must be an ambidextrous church. Because when you go out there, you are going to face men and women who don't like you. And you are going to plan against you. They think about finishing you. That's why you need to know, where is my altar? So when they are challenging your kingship, you open your windows towards your altar. And you pray towards your altar. Allow your altar to speak for you in that situation. And allow your altar to fight on your behalf. So we are talking about men and women who are, even though they are in the civil service, they are in business, they are, am I talking to someone, they are in the corporate world, still they know where they are, their altar is. And if they find they are being, facing challenges here in the marketplace, they don't go to witches and wizards. They go towards the altar that speaks on their behalf. Am I making sense? So that people are wondering, where are you getting your answers from? Your answers are not coming from any other place. It's coming from the altar which you service. That you never tell him, neighbor, do you know your altar? Because when you are reigning as a king, you need to know where your altar is. And listen to that title. You are priests unto this God. As a priest to God, my brother, my sister, you have an altar of the cross of Calvary. The book of Hebrews says, we have an altar here, Pastor Ken Oyola, of which some people are not allowed to eat of. 
Those who serve in the Old Testament are not supposed to eat on the altar in which we service. We service an altar where the blood of the Son of the Living God was shed. And friend, that altar is powerful. If you understood that, you'll understand what I'm trying to teach you. He has made us into priests and king. Oh yeah, they've got it for you. Hebrews 13, 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The altar of Calvary. Those who want to go back to the Old Testament stuff have no right to eat on this altar. But this altar, the one we serve, friends, fights, speaks, raises, protects you from any other altar. Somebody say amen. Because the work of a priest, now listen to me, the work of a priest is to service the altar. Is to make sure the fire in the altar they never dies off. Is to make sure the sacrifices are there. Is to make sure the oil in the lamp never dries out. Is to make sure the bread is, is changed every 24 hours. Am I talking to somebody here? The work of the priest is to make sure there is fire that will never die on this altar. That is what the priests were meant to do. So as long as you are servicing this altar, the fire never dies. The bread is changed. Hello? Are you still with me? The ubani, na uvumba, the incense is still burning at all times. When fukiza uvumba at the right time. The oil is changed so that the lamp never goes out at this altar. My brother, I can assure you, the altar you service will always rise up at the right time in any place and fight for you as you are out there as a king. Think about it, Ken. With all their training, their Malachite soldiers could not de defeat a ragtag army of Israelites as long as the hands of Moses. I'm telling you to think. The Bible says, as soon as the hands of Moses went down, the Israelites were losing. Is that Exodus 17? Find that in Exodus 17. That's why he built an altar called Ebenezer. As long as his hands were up, the SG, Israel was winning. He's, when his hands went down, Israel was losing. So, his two friends, Aaron, his brother, and Hur, another priest, they did not tell him, oh, Moses, find your Ivy. Because it was not in the hands. You are, not, you are not getting my message here. It's not just in the hands. Because there were some covenants God had entered with Moses. At the burning bush. He had not entered the same covenant with Aaron and with whom. See, there are some people we may meet and you think they are just people, yet they are systems. Amen. You don't understand what I'm trying to say. You see, if you know the altar you are servicing, you become a mini systems of the big system. So when people are dealing with you, they are not dealing with you. They are dealing with a system. Yes. Am I making sense? So imagine, Pastor Richard, it does not matter what training the Amalekite army had, they could not win. Mikono too. You tell me nini koko mikono. If you understand the altar you service, and you understand what the altar, that altar is capable of, you'll go to the marketplace with courage, not fear. Hallelujah. Shake your neighbor, tell him, I told you, my life will never, ever be the same again. I am a king and I'm a priest. So you are reigning out of your priesthood. Out of your priesthood. What do the kings do? The kings reign. The kings rule. The kings exercise authority. 
kings make decrees. The first assignment God gave to man, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 and 28. Look at it. It was that of reigning and rulership. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have what? Dominion. That word dominion is a matter of rulership. Verse 27. Then he says, so God, I thought we were reading with you. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So ladies, are you included in this? Don't come and say, you know, only men are kings. Shut up. You are included here. You are not an afterthought. Hello? You are a she king. I've just made up that word. Is that proper English? It's all right, eh? Yeah. Let us make some words. One of these days you may find it is in Oxford's dictionary. She king. Like Dr. If doctor is now an official word of a man who stops you eating meat. Si hata chokora ni neno official sasa. Lele za tu kimchezo. Eh somebody does not speak German is called a chokora. I like that. <laughs> so God created man in his own in the image of God he created male and female he created then look at verse 28. What does this say? And then he blessed them. Woo no, in the beginning, God never cast you. Amen. God is not angry with you. He never cast you in the starting. You're not a cast creation. Even your color is not your problem. It's your thinking. That's why we say, I let go of past traditions and failures that I've held until now. So that I can embrace God's new principles. It's in the renewing of your mind. That's what we are trying to do here. So you can begin to see yourself the way God sees you. Not the way your mother said you are. Your mother said you are Jabez. Don't die Jabez. Even Jabez, I refuse to die Jabez. And God had him. And he answered him. And he canceled what the mother had said. But Bishop, you don't know my mother. Then you don't know my God. That's right. My God is greater than your mother. Yeah. You, know, you know the way boys tell my father can beat your father. I'm telling you my God can beat your mother. <laughs> so what your mother said about you, what your father said about you, what your former boyfriend said about you, what your ex-wife said when she was leaving you, shall not determine your future. Your future shall be determined by thus says what does the Lord say? He blessed them and God said be what? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Do what? Subdue it and do what? Have communion. And you are still walking like a chicken that has got no head. Or it has been rained on. Somebody say amen. amen. Are we learning something here? Amen. It's important you catch that the first assignment God gave us is that of government. And what else? And rulership. That's very, very important. And a church that's ambidextrous is a church that understands. I'm going to, through stuff that's not in your notes. So it's, this is in my notes. If you want, I'll give them to you later. Uh, like in his last I'm Are we still together, friends? Is that church that has got deep spiritual intelligence rooted in the presence of the Holy Spirit, like the men and women have been teaching you about for the last four or five weeks? Are we together, friends? I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2. What does it say? Well, oh, sorry, verse 9. Sorry, verse 9. But as it is, I thought you were reading together. 
But as it is, what is written? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The things which God has prepared for those who do what? Are there lovers of God in this house? I'm asking, are there lovers of God in this house? There are things that God has prepared. I say there are things that God has prepared. There's some stuff that God has prepared. But no eye has seen it. No ear has heard it. Neither has it entered the understanding of any man. Why? Because it is the glory of God to conceal. But the glory of kings to search it out. Are there kings in this house? Yes. I say, are there kings in this house? Yes. Because he says in verse 10, beginning of verse 10, but, are you seeing that? But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Why? For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So we are talking about a church made up of kings Hello? And priests who are able to search out what God has concealed about the seven mountains of influence. Am I talking to somebody here? There are things that politicians out there don't know. But you Touch you and I'll tell you, you, Mwambia with authority, you can find them out. Hata hii coronavirus, tikuye mwa kutafuta buwana, tutapata jibu. Wana asuwe sana. Uyo ni maandiko. There are things that eyes have not seen. In other words, you know, don't learn them in university. Cognitive intelligence will not give you this. Emotional intelligence will not give you this. Financial intelligence cannot give you this. Social intelligence cannot teach you this. This one needs spiritual intelligence. That's why I start discovering. That's where people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Esther, Mordecai, jo Joseph, Paul, Jesus became relevant in their generation and transform us. So that's the church we are talking about. Not only that, but at the same time this church has discovered and developed their marketplace cap capacity. I'm in Matthew 25 verse 14 to 30. We cannot just be good discovering things, but we must understand these words of Jesus. For the kingdom, I thought you were reading with me. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave what? To another, to another, to each according to his own ability and immediately went on to a journey. Whom do you think he's talking about here? Himself. He says, I've come, but I'm going. But before I come back, you have five, you have got two. You've got one. In other words, we are not going to ride on the same mountain. We don't have equal abilities. But listen to me, friends. One talent from God is enough for you to change a whole village. Don't underestimate it. And you know, the problem with us is that we become jealous. How come you gave him five and you gave me two? Shut up. He gave you according to your ability. And if you can use what he has given you, I can assure you, he'll multiply it. Amen. When he comes back, he's asking them this very simple question. Look at this verse. Very simple question. I'm back in Matthew 25. If you're wondering where I am. I'm, I'm in verse, I've gone beyond. I'm verse 16. Then he, he had received what? Five talents went and traded with them and made another. And likewise, you had received two gained. 
But look at this Kenya. Konga jirani yako mwambie toka hiyo. To, mwambie toka kwa hiyo. Mwambie next time. You are operating at that level. Don't sit next to me. Unfortunately, there are many people who don't understand what I'm teaching you. So they are operating at this level. They went, dug in the ground, hid his Lord's money. In other words, they are playing it safe. No risk. We've been here 35 years. You think if we never took risks, you have been sitting in a building like this? cathedrals. For us to be here, we took risks. We took what? And we did not we did not shy away in walking the path that other people feared to walk. Am I talking to somebody here? I'm trying to push you to see that in the area of your operation, you have the potential to grow and grow until you become the dominant force. Hallelujah. So we are talking about a church here, Pastor Oscar, that understands. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10 and also operates in the world in the order of Matthew 25, 14 to 30. I don't have time to read the entire verse but it's 14 to 30. Those who understand as I get to the marketplace I need to operate to the principles of the marketplace. Don't go to the marketplace and you are speaking in tongues. Takuja hapa kuniambia kiosk haina kitu. Sababu ulikunywa maziwa yote. Ndio wa kipira anambia kunywa soda na hiyo ni faida yako kwa hiyo chup crate. Mtu akipira ambia chukua maziwa chumbili upelekea watoto nyumbani. Na hiyo ndio faida yako. Crete. Crete moja ya maziwa. Hizo paketi mwile zukaka faida umepeana. Si utafunga hiyo duka. Umepeleka priesthood. Mahali where you are supposed to be a king. Gonga jirani yako ambia pwe. Usipeleke ukuhani. Mahali unapaswa kuwa mfalme. And the bishop told us to be generous. Where we are biashara ni biashara. One as well, sir. Are we together? Now, that foundation is important for us to understand. I'll be working. I'll be working on it. But let me show you something. Are you ready for this? I mean, look. Chapter 4, verse 16. This is Jesus after his baptism, after the temptation, he has overcome the devil. What does the Bible say? So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Yesu ameenda oshago. Kule alizali? Kuna wengine mkienda oshago mwanagi kanisa. Yesu anasema ilikuwa kawaida yake kuendaga kani? Akienda wapi? Kuna wengine mkipua leave from Nairobi na fikiku paka leave ya kuenda church. Leave ni ya kuenda kazi. Si ya kuenda kanisa. Ameenda church. Akasoma maandi? Na hundu? Watch this scripture very carefully because we are going to where, it was this, where Jesus was reading from. What does it say? And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Verse 19, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant, sat down. All the eyes and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. What does the Bible say next? And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your Watch this language. Because if you don't understand this, you don't understand when we start talking about the mountains of influence and your part in it. When Jesus read verse 19, verse 19, 19, that's 18, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20 says, he closed the book. What did he say? Today, this scripture is fulfilled. In other words, what he's saying, hey, now that I've come, this is my assignment. This is what I will do. I'll only do it up to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But the question is, he was reading from Isaiah. Did Isaiah stop there? Isaiah 61. From verse 1. Same scripture. This is where he was reading from. <laughs> this is how we study the Bible. What did he read? The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the... Shh. You see that why he stopped? He, I ask, is the, isn't that why he stopped? So he's telling you, I came to fulfill this scripture up to there. From there... It's not my assignment. It's your assignment. So what is our assignment? And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn in Zion and to console all those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called what? Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be that's the assignment I have here with you. Why not for son? Are you getting the picture now? He did not finish that promise because the rest of the promise is for the church to enforce, not for him. Yeye Kaziake ilikuwa up to proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. From there, give me this nani uh, nipati NLT. Give me a more simpler translation. I pick it from verse 2. From verse 2. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that of the, of the Lord's favor has come. And with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all those who mourn in Israel, he'll give what? A crown of beauty for ashes, joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they'll be like a great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. That talks the authority now that we have. I have no time now to go through the entire chapter, but you can go home and read it. If you start reading about the entire chapter, it is actually now enforcing the rule and the government of God here on earth. You get the picture now? So, in other words, it says, me I came up to here, I've left. What is coming next is your responsibility. That's why you must understand the purpose of the church. The purpose of the? The purpose of the? If our purpose, Mutuma, was to get saved and go to heaven, then every evangelist will be having a machine gun. As soon as you are saved, psh, go to heaven. Psh, go to heaven. Amen. Psh. But the reason you never died, 
This side they didn't. They, they. Can I preach on this side? Yes. The reason God has kept you alive, yes. He has got an assignment for you. Yes. Though you are a priest, He wants you also as a what? Many of us understand our priestly role. We don't understand our kingly role. Where we enforce the rule of God in every sphere of society. You are a planting of God in the government, in business, in the legal system. He has planted you there for his own glory. An oak tree, an oak tree is a solid tree. And you are like an oak planted. Wherever you are, you are planted there as an oak. You are immovable, unshakable. Until you bring the glory of God to bear in that area. And I've told you before, tell your neighbor for me, neighbor. God does not need your employer to give you money. He can give you money from any quarter. The reason you are in that company is because God has planted you there as an, as an oak of what? Righteousness for his own glory. To, in, to bring what enforcing the rule and the reign of God over his enemies. Are we making sense now? Now, let me introduce. I'm laying, I'm, I was laying a biblical theological foundation. Are we still friends? Have I lost you anywhere? When you understand that, then you'll begin to understand what Isaiah chapter 2 now says. This is where we are getting our lessons from. What does it say? Now, you are reading with me, what does it say? Now it shall come to pass. In the latter days, watch up. In the what? What are the latter days? The last? Latter means the last? Nileo. That. What does it say? That. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. And shall be exalted above the hills. And all the nations shall flow into it. Sing of us. Very pregnant with truth. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in chapter 2. Remember about his dream? Remember? Which he forgot. Do you remember? He had a dream which he did what? Go to Daniel chapter 2. Get, get me that dream. And he started killing all the wise men who could not give him an interpretation. Do you remember? Until they came to Daniel. Daniel asked Ariok, why are you killing these men? He says, because you guys, the king had a dream and he has done what? Forgotten it. But if you don't, if you know it, tell him. And David, Daniel said, let me go and pray. He went for spiritual intelligence. And in the dreams of the night, he saw what the king had dreamt and had forgotten. Okay? I'll give you this picture better to, more tomorrow, but catch it now. The secret is revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever, for wisdom and might are his. And it changes times at all. Go, end and belly, end and belly. I don't know. You are king watching and behold a great image. That's where I want to start. A great what? That is a great image whose splendor was excellent. Read for me. Was excellent. Stood before you. And its form was awesome. The image head was fine. Gold. Its chest was arms of silver. Its belt the thighs of, and thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron. Its feet partly of Iron and partly off. Ash. This is what troubled the king. Go to verse 33. You watched. You watched. While a what? A stone was cut out without hands. 
We struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind did what? Carried them away so that no trace of them was found. Continue now. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Get revelation quickly. Touch your neighbor. May the spirit of revelation come upon you. Daniel gives the interpretation. Are you getting with me now? And he tells Nebuchadnezzar, this is now you can find us read the story. All these are different kingdoms of different and lowering stature. Head of gold, chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, feet of clay. Those are only all of them minerals. Gold is precious. Silver is lesser. Bronze is a mixture. Iron is valueless. Clay, no value. And he tells him, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what God is showing you. These are different kingdoms that shall come. That shall? You are the splendor. You are the head of gold. But before, after you, another king's kingdom shall come of less value. The Medes and the Persians. That's where Darius comes in. After that, they'll be defeated by another kingdom. That was the kingdom of the Greeks. That's for the bronze. And then after that, the Greeks should be defeated by the Romans. Because the Romans had two portions. That's why it's in two legs. But as the Roman Empire begins to disintegrate, there will be a mixture of clay. In other words, some parts of it will be strong, others will be weak. Then he says, in the days of those kings that were defeated, the Roman Empire, there is a stone that shall be raised without any hands. Oh, Luanda, Luagasoto, Rock of Ages. That's when the church was born. Jesus came and died during the Roman Empire and said, I will build my church upon this rock. Are you getting revelation? So that rock he established that Nebuchadnezzar saw was the church which was built with that human hands. So the sovereign work of God comes and strikes this image at the feet during the Roman Empire. And whatever the gold and silver and bronze and iron are done is all crushed. And today, friends, as we sit here, you cannot remember about the Babylonian Empire unless we tell you. There's nothing you remember about the Medes and the Persians Empire unless we tell you. There's nothing you remember about the Greek Empire unless we tell you. The Roman Empire died and is gone unless... But the church that was established at that time has continued to do what? To grow. And it has become what? It has become a big... That's why Isaiah chapter 2 says, And the mountain... What is he saying? And the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of in other words, as the mountain of the Lord's house is being established, don't you forget there are already other mountains. Am I making sense? But the mountain of the house of God is supposed to be established above those mountains. So that, read for me, what does it say? Then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven. What are they saying? The kingdoms of this world have done what? Have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign if we do our assignment properly, we shall bring the kingdoms of this world under the kingdom of our Lord. So that he does not just reign. You see, when it comes to Jesus, once he comes in, I don't reign. 
I say, once Jesus comes into the picture, I don't reign. He reigns. Because he's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. He's the god above every god. Am I making sense? But he's depending on the church to bring that to pass. Now, hold that knowledge. Am I giving you too much information? Is this too much? Luke chapter 4, verse 5. In the temptation of Jesus. This second temptation. What does it say? Then the devil, talk to me, read, read with me. What does it say? Then the devil taking her on a high, that's a mountain. This is one of the mountains which the devil controls. It's a mountain of influence. He has tempted Jesus with bread. Jesus is not tempted. But he knows somewhere along the line, Jesus has come to take the kingdom back from him. So he tries to give him a shortcut. So he takes him on one of the mountains, the mountains of governance and politics. And he takes him on this high mountain. What does he say? He showed him, come on, start, start getting revelation here. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. What did you do in Revelation 11, 15? And the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So the devil knew Christ has come for these kingdoms. So he's telling him, hey, these kingdoms are actually mine. I can give them to you if you worship me. What does he say? And the devil said to him, you're already reading with me. What does he say to him? All this authority I'll give to you. And there, glory ni pesa, na pesa zao zote. For this has been delivered to me. Look, look at his language. This has been delivered. Christ does not answer with him. I does not argue with him. Why? Because he knew the devil was speaking the truth to some degree. They were delivered to him. By who? By Adam. When Adam submitted to him, he delivered to him his authority. That's what the devil says. They have been delivered to me. Look at the next sentence. And I, well, and I give it to whomsoever I wish. They are mine. I give them to this one. It's called the kingdom the mountain of politics and governance. This is one of the mountains of influence. This one, the devil controls himself. There are seven. This one, the devil controls himself. You can see it from this scripture. It says, this is mine. Because Is this too much revelation for you? It's in scripture. Am I quoting abracadabra? See, I'm showing you in the mountain, uh, in scripture. So this is one of the mountains. It's the mountains, the mountain of the house of God shall rise above all there. Now this one, they would say a high mountain. So these mountains are not low. They are, they are not hills. There are mountains. That's why there are seven. There are how many? Seven. So I'm just showing you one. In my notes, they will show you. It's not just one. The kingdom of this world are called mountains by prophet Isaiah. That's the scripture I was showing you all the time. And there are seven. Put, put up the list there, let me show you. There are seven mountains. What, what is the first one? Why are you whispering? You think my God is here to come on Abraham Tian? What's the first one? Arts and entertainment. Second? It's a mountain. Number third one? Fourth one? This is another one. The devil controls himself. The next one? Then? Finally? What do we mean by mountains of influence? What is influence? 
Influence is a force that makes you do what you do. Influence is the power to affect something or events, especially the power based on prestige, money, name. So when you talk about the mountains of influence, we are talking about there are things that make you behave the way you behave. Talk the way you talk. Vote the way you vote. Buy the things you buy. Hello? You're not just, don't just, just wake up and ah, there's something influencing you. And some of this depends on where did you go to school? That's education. What's your religion? What media are you listening to? And these seven things, I put there another point, another um, definition of influence. I'm getting it from Webster's Dictionary. A cognitive factor that tends to have an effect on what you do. As a man thinketh, so is he. What is it that informs your thinking? That's what we are calling influence. So what we are saying here, there are seven mountains that influence the way we think, the way we do stuff, the way things we say. And some of these mountains, the seven of them, we have told you the first one is what? Put up the list again. Arts and entertain. Do you know there are some things you do because of the kind of music you listen to? The kind of programs you watch? The kind of station you tune to? If you're just watching Niger movies, you'll believe in witchcraft. And you'll be seeing demons everywhere. You'll even start believing I can turn into a snake as I'm teaching here. Because you have seen so many actors turn into snakes until that is, it starts controlling you. Second one is what? Education. The kind of education you received. Why you went to school. You know there are people who talk the way they talk because they were in a certain school. I was in alliance. This is not our precious blood. Talk to me. Nelikwa Maranda boys. So it, it, all of it, education. The third one is what? Family. Where did you come from? What is your father like? What is your mother like? What, were your what kind of atmosphere do you have as a family? If you lived with a father who beat your mother, you will think beating your wife is a normal thing. You'll wonder why some of us have never beaten our wives. So we will check our kwanza. And that has formed your thinking. Number four, business and commerce. Some of us buy stuff because we have seen the commercial. Vile me kwa advertise. Vile me package. Surayake. That's why they always use a beautiful woman to advertise a car. Actually, you wonder what does a woman and a car go to do? But they know. Once you see a beautiful woman sitting on top of a bonnet, of a motorcar, You'll get of your, rid of your car and go and buy that one. And believe next time you come in, in the morning, you would have find a beautiful woman sitting on your car. <laughs> Government and politics. This one controls the way we think. Kenyans were intentional until the handshake. Suddenly, oh, handshake, handshake. No, no. Just... You ask yourself, what just happened? Yesterday, there were people who were not talking. 
But after handshake, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> it, 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 am I talking to somebody? Yeah. Ten years ago, someone told us it's the best constitution in the world. Now they're saying, no, it's not. We are changing it. And do you know something? They will say, yeah, change it. You haven't even read the old constitution. You never read the old constitution. You never read the new one. You have not even read the BBI report, but you're still saying change it. Politics. What's the next one? Who are you listening to? Radio, TV, Tandao. These are influences. Last one, religion. Are you a Christian, Muslim? Are you an atheist? Are you Hindu? All these things are mountains of influence. We shall be talking about them this week so that you get to understand how they influence you and where God wants you to play. Because all these mountains must come under the mountain. Ah, there's a sister was get revelation. All these mountains must come under the mountain of the house of and the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. On top of the mountains and the hills. In other words, where you see a mountain of government and politics, there are other hills. ODM is a hill. Jubilee is a hill. DNA is a small hill. <laughs> but there are hills around this mountain. Am I talking to somebody here? And all these hills, oh sorry, all these mountains have got gatekeepers in every country. Can you imagine what would have happened if Michael Jackson, by mistake, by, had said, I am born again? Just by mistake. Because he was a gatekeeper. Now it's Kanye West. All these mountains have got gatekeepers. Imagine if Kirubi came to this church next Sunday. Because he's a gatekeeper. Those are gatekeepers in commerce and industry. Am I? Now, Koroga Kidogo. They have got gatekeepers. All these have got gatekeepers. So that's what we, we're working on this week. Are you ready for it now? Yes. Are you ready to, learn, to understand this lesson? Yes. Have you learned something tonight? Have we given a biblical foundation of where we are going? Yes. Have you seen what Christ is expecting of the church? Yes. What he never finished, that's our assignment. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, 21, 22, 23. Let's finish with that. Ephesians 1. And he walked in Christ as he raised it from the dead. Go, go 21. Maybe that's too much. Far above, no, go to verse 22. And he, yeah, put it, what does it say? And he put all things under, under, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Give me that in the message Bible, 22 23. Okay? What does it say? He is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. Go to verse 23. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. In Adonjo, can you go and memorize that? Because by the end of Friday, we shall be speaking that by heart. So read it for the last time as we close. What does it say? The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. So wherever you are, you are the planting of the Lord. Ox of righteousness. 
to bring glory and honor to him, to fill everything on behalf of Christ. Memorize Ephesians 1.23 in the Message Bible. We'll pick up from there.